Before we start, I'd like to dedicate this session to Maria Ofdieva, who woke up this morning at 4.40 after Russia fired S-300 missiles at Kharkiv. Maria, who has appeared on our panels and who is expertly covering the Russia-Ukraine war, tweeted that one of the S-300 missiles hit a children's football field while the second one landed near the entrance to the metro. Those are both civilian targets. So this ses session is dedicated to you, Maria. Um, today, we will focus on the economic scars of the war, and we will specifically zoom in on questions related to the economic damage done to Ukraine, immediate economic and development support, as well as long-term reconstruction and development needs. To help us unpack these complicated issues, it is my pleasure to welcome two very distinguished panelists. Professor Timothy Milovanov, president of Kiev School of Economics. Aside from a variety of prestigious academic accomplishments, he is also an advisor to President Zelensky and he's held a post, the post of Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture of Ukraine in 2019 to 2020. My second guest is the wonderful Natalia Shapoval, chairperson of the KSE Institute and vice president for policy research at the Kiev School of Economics. Now, uh, Timothy, if you don't mind, I'm going to start off by asking a question to Natalia, actually. If you could unmute for me, please. Natalia, can you provide us with an overall estimate of the economic impact of the conflict on Ukraine? How is that calculated and how does that compare with Russian losses as a result of sanctions? Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, as of now, the, on the surface, it seems that uh, uh, Russia's uh, economy suffers uh, like smaller figures of losses than Ukrainian ones. Uh, specifically in like relative terms to the economy, uh, Ukraine lost uh, over the first quarter around 15% of the GDP that's already recorded uh, fall. And the forecast is that the overall fall will be around 30% by the end of the year. Uh, in uh, Russia, uh, it's still something between 10-15% uh, of GDP loss by the end of the year. Uh, however, the, uh, in absolute terms, not relative, like percentages, of course, given that Russian economy is 10 times bigger than Ukrainian, their loss is likely to be generally larger. So uh, uh, the Russian economy is also suffering because of sanctions. So it uh, wouldn't be correct uh, to say that uh, they, they are not damaged and uh, the scars uh, of far for them are only this 10-15% uh, or something. Russia is uh, losing fundamentally their production capacity of oil they are losing their largest market of uh, gas that historically were uh, about 40% of uh, their uh, budget revenues uh, and basically the largest proportion of uh, uh, their industry. And uh, these losses would be irreversible. Um, so that's probably for the start. Uh, as a short answer to your question, and please uh, direct me uh, further. Thank you. I think that was a good, uh, uh, quick overview of the situation uh, in in Ukraine, and also compared in comparison with Russia. Uh, before we circle back to that, let's go to Timothy now. Uh, Timothy, how much? Uh, will reconstruction of the Ukrainian economy cost? And very importantly, who will pay for that? Thank you. Yeah, my, my, it was a question to me. Sorry, my connection is not ideal. That's correct. I'm asking yeah. about uh, how much reconstruction will, will it, uh, how much will reconstruction of the Ukrainian economy cost and who will pay for it? So the direct damages at this point uh, are in the order of $100 billion. Uh, direct damages meaning the infrastructure, schools, residential housing, um, 
and the cost is calculated at the recovery cost. What it would cost to bring it back? So if we want to bring back Ukraine to the state uh, before the war, purely physically, that would be $100 billion. That doesn't include uh, people, that doesn't include lost businesses, that doesn't include migration, that would cost even more, creating environments and paying for that. Then um, there is uh, the idea of build back better, meaning that sometimes we might not necessarily want to build the old buildings to recover. It is as it was, we want to build a modern energy efficient building. Um, then it would cost $165 billion. And now if we want to be ambitious over the next 10 years and take into account the economic losses, the opportunity cost um, of the lost GDP and so on, then the numbers become staggering from $400, $500 billion up to $750 billion. And here we're not even counting, uh, let's say the cost of the mining or the environmental impact because uh, at this moment, about half of the Ukrainian territory, at least one third, is considered to be risky simply to walk on. Of course, the military has demined, uh, you know, the roads and the main cities. Uh, but outside of that, uh, I personally, you know, when we pull over a car on a road, we're afraid to step outside of where the car stopped because it could simply be a mine. And I think yesterday, a farmer near Kiev just blew up his tractor because he ran into a mine and the environmental damage add to it. So this is going to, you know, depending on how you, you count, it might cost a lot. Um, however, you know, where's the money is coming from? During the war, it should be IFIs, it should be bilateral, multilateral assistance. And of course, unfortunately, because that assistance at this point is not enough and it's a bit slow. And I, I think in many ways, it's a big scandal. Uh, Ukraine is forced to fi uh, uh, finance the war through through emissions, through monetary means, and that uh, creates macroeconomic risks. And we have already been seeing large inflation and devaluation of the currency exchange and restructuring for the uh, Ukrainian foreign debt. So these are uh, these are uh, symptoms that uh, Ukraine is needs more support. So um, after the war or immediately or later, I think there are essentially, again, three sources of uh, funding. One is the frozen assets of the Russian Federation. That would be the most ethical and the most fair way to finance reconstruction by confiscating those assets. But that requires some political process. Um, then the you know, taxpayers of the, of the European Union of North America and taxpayers of Ukraine. Um, you can talk about different techniques, whether we want to form an agency or a coordinating platform, whether the EU should take the lead or G7 or the US, but these are details which are being constantly discussed and changed. But fundamentally, in my view, it should be Russian funding. Thank you, Timothy. Um, so, I mean, taking together what you and Natalia are saying, uh, Natalia is, is, is saying that uh, Ukraine has taken a major knock. It could be as hard as 30% of the country's GDP. And then in addition to that, uh, in terms of the destruction that's happened to Ukraine, we could add um, uh, several other figures, whether it's between 100 and $500 billion uh, to recover, depending on how that is calculated. Now, um, I want to latch on to this last point that you mentioned, Timothy. Um, is there a possibility to actually use Russian assets to cover at least some aspects of the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian economy? Uh, we know that, um, as you mentioned, uh, Russia has a number of uh, uh, funds, uh, about 600 billion US dollars in foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and about of that, about 300 uh, billion dollars uh, is is frozen and, and, and sort of kept in, in so-called allied countries, so the US and Europe and, and Japan. So uh, my question to you is, I guess, um, uh, what are the legalities involved in using some of those, those funds for Ukraine's economy? And, and um, would, would Russian assets even make 
a difference in the recovery. Thank you. Timothy, you guys hear you're, you're muted. You're, you're muted, Timothy. Thank you. Uh, according to the Kiev School of Economics estimates, the number of available assets uh, to be frozen and later con confiscated, the, the funds are in the range of about 540 billion and um, 350 of it is from the central bank reserves. There is a fundamental gravity to it. Kind of, you know, like when we talk about fundamentals of economics, we say, you know, uh, we, the markets are moving this way, but they're moving away from the fundamentals. So there's, there's a sense of, uh, there's something similar in politics or in geopolitics. There's a geopolitical fundamentals, who should pay for the war, reparations or recovery. And when a European politician would be thinking about a choice between uh, its own euro, you know, the euro of a given country, taxpayers funds or some budgetary funding allocated this, or getting Russian frozen funds to, to be used. Of course, it looks better to use the Russian funds just because it's not your funds. Uh, with this comes the political cost of doing this. And this political cost is especially high in the beginning of the war because Russia is nasty, Russia is making threats, uh, Russia is taking action. And at the same time, the cost of using taxpayers' funds is in the beginning of the war is lower because the fatigue is not there and everyone is engaged and wants to help Ukraine. Over time, the different weights on these considerations will be changing. It will become more and more difficult to use domestic taxpayers funding and it will become easier assuming the Ukraine is going to win or, or restrain and resist Russia successfully and Russia will continue to be isolated politically and there will be a united front among the democracies in the world. The cost of imposing confiscation, the political cost for each jurisdiction of imposing confiscation on Russia will be smaller because there will be precedents, there will be examples, um, and the influence of Russia will be smaller, uh, influence to resist that. Right now we have Canada moving forward, they passed the legislation. Of course, all of this will be challenged in law, uh, in courts, uh, but I think other countries will follow. If we go through the formal um, court, legal routes, that's gonna take forever because we're still um, seeing cases in courts from 2014 and many of them or from MH17 or from, you know, they are not being resolved. Uh, so they will, the countries will have to pass laws and then they will be somewhat tested in the courts and then the assets will be used. I think that's possible. We will see a different world. Um, there are examples of that from uh, Iraq, uh, Kuwait uh, in 90s. So, you know, I, I, I think Russian assets will be used for reconstruction. And yes, it will be enough in my view because it's such a large sum. At least it will be the major chunk of the total support. Thank you, Timothy. And thank you also for mentioning that there is in fact, legal precedent uh, to do something along these lines. I'm, I'm going to go back to Natalia now. Um, Natalia, given the ongoing Russian threat and the cost of defending Ukraine, how much emphasis should there be on linking support for Ukraine's recovery plan with a security plan? Thank you, Natalia. Um, thank you, indeed. Uh, this is a very important link because uh, if you take this year, uh, for you, there is a like quite known figure that our Ministry of Finance uh, promotes that Ukraine needs around five billion dollars every month uh, to compensate for budget losses and to uh, lead the war. Uh, and of course, if uh, Ukraine would not be able to uh, receive sufficient amount of budget support by the end of this year, Ukraine would, it also would imply that uh, Ukraine would not be able to make some of the important payments to the uh, military sector, compensate uh, to people who are losing their relatives, uh, some salaries, pensions, to some, support some 
like other aspects of public sectors important for the uh, war infrastructure, for example. So uh, this is uh, really very much connected. Uh, and in the recovery plans that, uh, for example, our uh, government and office is presenting, uh, it always uh, goes hand in hand that uh, as part of the recovery, Ukraine needs not only infrastructure, but also you know, resilient infrastructure uh, that uh, would accommodate to the new realities uh, of living with such a neighbor, but also military, increasing military capabilities uh, and uh, increasing energy security and multiple other aspects. But uh, these three that I mentioned are the most uh, fundamental uh, because, uh, yeah, it's uh, there is uh, first uh, not no one knows how much the war gonna be, but it's pretty much clear that the more Ukraine is uh, prepared militarily, uh, the uh, shorter it can be. And uh, secondly, if it's not a short story, and if the end of the war would not be, you know, like miraculous, uh, Russia uh, loses and uh, recognizes that which is really unlikely, then we still have to live with uh, the neighbor, which still would require from Ukraine really much more uh, stronger uh, military uh, sector. Uh, and uh, yeah, th therefore that's a big part of all the recovery, uh, but probably you know, much less talked about on open uh, meetings uh, about the recovery plans. Thank you, Natalia. Let me ask you a follow-up question then, just while we're talking about the recovery plan, which, which sectors are the most critical in terms of Ukraine's uh, uh, recovery? Can you expand on that for us, please? So uh, infrastructure is very critical. Uh, first, because uh, some uh, roads and bridges are uh, connect, like connecting uh, cities that were and localities that were disconnected uh, due to the war. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of like really huge amount of uh, roads, uh, something between 10 and 15% uh, are destroyed and they are not useful for uh, the uh, kind of leading uh, uh, neither business uh, nor uh, effective uh, military engagement in the long term. Um, so secondly, it's uh, also uh, some public sector aspects like healthcare, because specifically in healthcare, the level of damages is very, very large. So out of uh, uh, a little bit more than 3000 hospitals, more than 600 hospitals were destroyed. So that's a very large proportion. And uh, it means that some of the uh, parts of uh, Ukraine really don't have uh, access to uh, basic um, health care. And thirdly, it's uh, energy sector. Firstly, because uh, the war uh, is coming. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, and yeah, so why the war is coming is a factor is because Ukraine also uh, was dependent on uh, Russian gas. Yes, we had contracts with other countries, but uh, still uh, we were importing gas from Russia. Uh, right now, Ukraine has all the chances to uh, enter the new heating season with zero imports, but that uh, would require really significant uh, investment in uh, different aspects of transfer to uh, uh, to like reducing uh, use of uh, uh, energy for housing, for example. So changing some technology, uh, this uh, isolation of buildings, etc., cetera, uh, some uh, quick modernization of the uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, if it's not uh, happening, then uh, still there are, uh, so if uh, such investment would not come on time, um, and it's very highly probable that they are not coming on time, then there will be other needs for, to prepare for the uh, winter. Uh, like and like also gas for emergency purposes uh, or coal for emergency purposes uh, or 
you know, other solutions that uh, would uh, help uh, people that might lose uh, supply of um, heating uh, and uh, hot water because of the uh, military interventions. I think uh, that's our uh, some of the most critical, if we are not talking about this food security issues, but there the client kind of are not Ukrainians merely as consumers, but um, the uh, importers of uh, Ukrainian uh, agri products uh, in Africa and the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I definitely want to ask you a follow up question later on on this issue of food. Uh, insecurity, but um, uh, uh, so basically the main sectors, as you mentioned, uh, infrastructure, healthcare, and then the energy sector are, are the most critical at this point. We haven't even touched the issue of the education sector that's been pummeled also in the process. Um, but let's first turn to Timothy again. Um, Timothy, we've heard about the amount of money involved uh, or anticipated for the reconstruction and recovery of Ukraine. What can we do to make sure that the funding gets to where it's supposed to go? And here I'm not merely referring to issues re related to accountability of, of Ukraine or Ukrainian authorities, but also uh, uh, perhaps when we're talking about that it doesn't just go to donors, you know, the, 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 the typical salaries of, of the World Bank and the IMF or, or whatever the case may be. Thank you, Timothy. Yeah, let's start with an example. Um, I am both employed by the Kiev School of Economics and by the University of Pittsburgh. If I were to be on a project by the USAID through the University of Pittsburgh to, let's say, help with advising of the government of Ukraine, I would be paid about $1,000 to $2,000 per day because it's a risky area, it's a war theater, there is insurance uh, and all kinds of overheads and liabilities, but I would just be paid that much myself for a, a risk because uh, even in the peacetime, I would be paid as a consultant from the US, I would pay $1,000 a day for Ukraine. In Ukraine, at the KEC, because it's war, because we are fighting for our own country, we capped our salaries. And now I'm getting 50,000 hryvnias, which is less than uh, $2,000 a month. So that's your 30 times differential between me being employed through KEC and me being employed through a US institution. Of course, there is an issue of accountability and corruption and transparency and efficiency and responsibility and fairness. All those issues are present and uh, the weaknesses or the issues which were there sometimes get cured by the war, sometimes they get exacerbated. Uh, corruption is in many ways cured because you know uh, we don't want to see a military or territorial defense lynching uh, people who are corrupt, uh, but we have seen cases. No, there was there was a video recently when uh, um, some Ukrainian police officers were charging ten dollars bribe for something at the checkpoint, and the military just came and in a vigilante way arrested them. And you know, so I don't think there is uh, uh, that's anecdotal evidence, but also by talking to politicians, I think the corruption of the cash in politics is gone for now at least, because people are simply afraid that they will be killed you know, by those who. By, by the people once they find out. On the other hand, you know, the questions of efficiency and competence, they sometimes and due process and making decisions properly and prioritizing and, you know, they get, uh, you know, they get blown up during the war. They become even more severe. Now let's, let's, let's move back or zoom out and simply uh, separate the process in three functions. One is we need to mobilize funding. Before we even talk about the funding, we need to mobilize it. Second, we need to deploy it and to make it an efficient way. And the third, uh, the third one, it has to be accountable and transparent. All three functions at this point are lacking. Mobilization requires coordination and that should be a platform or agency um, in Europe or maybe G7 or maybe somewhere among the IFIs. I have my views, it, sh it should be the EU and uh, the Ukrainian government together, joint plan form. So the Ukrainian government has 
authority and ownership over deployment and priorities, while the EU would have authority over mobilizing funding and then ensuring transparency and accountability. Uh, but it's not there. And the fact that people are not seriously thinking about creating such a platform or agency is simply going to jeopardize the stability of the economy in Ukraine during the war and the recovery after the war. And this is important because, you know, what Ukraine is doing now is not just uh, fighting a small isolated war. Russia is trying to change the way the geopolitics and diplomacy is done. It's basically saying diplomacy doesn't matter. We use force. And if they succeed, others will follow, not just Russia, but other countries. It will be a new status quo where the force could be used in the European Union or close to the European Union. So Ukraine is trying to resist that. And uh, Russia is pushing Ukraine in the war of attrition. And to stop the war of attrition is to, you know, the, the best way to stop the war of attrition is basically to demonstrate that Ukraine can keep up as long as needed, be it one year, two years, 10 years, you know. So there's no point to, for Russia to continue to persist. And the best outcome is simply to stop now and start negotiating. For that, we need to make sure that Ukrainian economy is strong. Because the moment the Russian government feels that Ukrainian economy can at some point reach the breaking point, the Kremlin gets the incentive to exactly to prolong the war until that point is reached. So we really need to get our act together, create this coordination agency, and start financing in a proper, efficient, and transparent way the Ukrainian economy, so we can stop the war earlier. Thank you. Those are some great points, Timothy. Uh, I'm going to turn to Natalia again, um, and feel free to also piggyback on some of those issues. But um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you, what is the importance, Natalia, uh, of the, uh, of sorry, what, what is the impact of the conflict on Ukraine's energy sector. You, you made some references to it earlier, but I was wondering if you could expand on that, please. Um, so from uh, what is more or less public on the energy sector, Ukraine significantly reduced consumption of energy, which is uh, uh, the reduction of around 15% or so. Uh, second uh, impact is, of course, that the uh, energy uh, infrastructure has been destroyed. Uh, our estimate, which I consider quite conservative, is around uh, 2 uh, billion of uh, uh, damages in the energy sector specifically. Uh, so uh, we're also losing some of the uh, basically transfer of the gas, but that's, uh, I would say, less you know, significant at this point. So um, Ukraine also lost uh, some production capacities, uh, like which is gas extraction. Uh, also for, I think this is around uh, between 10, between five and 10%, the reduction of how much Ukraine can extract. So more or less, it means uh, this uh, reduction in uh, supply, but also reduction in uh, uh, demand means that with uh, uh, decreased uh, consumption and more effective consumption, uh, which might mean, you know, like lower temperature at homes for several degrees, Ukraine might in principle go through the uh, winter season. Uh, but uh, beyond that, there is uh, important process in par parallel that Ukraine uh, electricity system, uh, basically in parallel with uh, Russian aggression, get very actively uh, integrated into European energy system. And already now we have a first contract where Ukraine sells the electricity uh, to uh, European countries. And uh, we like perceive that uh, this process will uh, only increase. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's also some interesting figures also uh, in terms of the energy sector, which is so vital also to having a healthy economy, which in turn also impacts, of course, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, the what happens on the battlefield to a certain extent. Um, you mentioned earlier also, you made a reference, Natalia, to the to this food crisis. And I'd like you to also expand on that. What will be the impact both on Ukraine's economy and or let's say on Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, as, as well as on the world with this with this food crisis, should Ukraine lose total access to the Black Sea? What's the importance of that? Um, so before the war, uh, Ukraine was uh, using uh, ports infrastructure for uh, 60 to 70 percent of uh, its overall trade. So you can imagine that uh, losing it is kind of uh, losing really a lot. Uh, right now, the even before this deblocking of the uh, Black Sea started, Ukraine still was uh, exporting uh, using several ports uh, in the Black Sea uh, to Europe, but otherwise was redirected some of the cargo through the uh, other through the roads basically and through the railways so the the impact would be huge and i know that uh, timothy can uh, uh, looked into it also so maybe he will also uh, step in and com comment a little bit on the uh, like uh, importance and scale i would like only to make one more argument on this i think like with energy uh, there is analogy with food so uh, right now, Europe and Ukraine, too, are suffering a lot from this energy crisis, specifically because we all allow this high dependency from Russia. And not only, I think, Europe allowed that. And over the last uh, 10 years, while Russia was increasing their bad behavior, uh, Europe was importing more and more uh, gas from, uh, from uh, Russia and was increasingly using the uh, gas transportation through the channels to circumvent Ukraine, uh, which also was contributing to this leverage. But similarly in uh, food. So the problem with uh, crisis in uh, uh, African continent in the Middle East, it also uh, allows Russia this manipulation only because uh, our, our community and maybe ourselves in Ukraine too were for many years ignoring the problem of these countries and they were so much dependent on these, you know, uh, changes in uh, grain uh, exports. And uh, I think uh, it's maybe too, you know, high level, but I think we all should be thinking more systemically how to uh, resolve food security uh, situation uh, globally so that, you know, any new Putin would not keep everyone uh, as hostages uh, with, uh, you know, experts. Timothy, would you please uh, add on uh, food security too, on how it's important and what you think about um, the, like, chances to deploy and what's going to happen? Yeah, all right. Please. So, thank you. So, um, Ukraine currently, before, without Odessa, exports 2.5 million tons a month, 1.5 goes through the new river. Before the war, it, ex it was able to export 5 million tons. So this 2.5, it's already increased the capacity to the extent possible because there've been investments. So it's, it's, um, it's 50%, but realistically, if we consider the hypothetical scenario, you know, I don't think it's going to happen because the, the, the Ukrainian troops and the Ukrainian people will fight tooth and nail. But in a parallel reality, in an alternative world, imagine Odessa, you know, would eventually not be deblocated. That basically means that the new would also be threatened. That imposes threats on the Romania ports as well because it's, it goes to, you know, whatever goes through the noob goes to Constance on they, they, they are not uh, investing as long as the situation in the, in, in the Northern Black Sea is not secure. And also it's gonna threaten this, this situation is gonna, if Russia were able to control the South of Ukraine, it will also threaten the Georgian ports, Batumi. So 
Ukraine would be forced to negotiate with Russia about access to the sea or Belarus to access to the Baltic. Um, so in that sense, I think this scenario creates a monopoly for Russia on any shipment from the Northern Black Sea. And it's gonna, this monopoly is gonna ex extend outside of Ukraine. It's a little bit like a gas situation, you know? So R Russia will have not only a second weapon in the sense of being the producer of uh, a grain, but also it will be able to block the logistics. But ports are more than just grain. There are major logistical routes going from China, from Northern China through Russia. And they, they get shipped either through Baltics or through Black Sea, or maybe by rail further. So that's the third weapon economic weapon that Russia has, and no one has been talking about. Essentially, if Russia can destabilize the entire region from the Baltic Sea to um, the Black Sea, it will be able to destabilize supply chains, for some of them, some of the supply chains from China to the EU. It's really a big deal. And I think people are underestimating its importance. If Russia also gets the south of Ukraine, it will be encouraged to get control over the Baltic Sea in the next 10, 15 years. Because once it get, gets access to the Baltic Sea and to the Black Sea, then it will be in the control of the old shipment routes between Asia and uh, Europe, uh, except those routes which go outside, way outside through the oceans. So the economic and strategic power of Russia will increase substantially. Uh, that's, I think, what's going to happen. So it's not going to be just a Ukrainian situation. It's going to be a major logistical issue for everyone. We'll see what happens with energy. We can imagine what happens if they control the entire region uh, logistically. I agree with Natalia that the, in the longer run, we should start thinking more. And Russia is actually forcing us to think more um, in terms of resilience of each individual economy. And, you know, maybe mm, we have to take more seriously the uh, competition authorities in the EU, uh, when they were, you know, they have to be more serious about ensuring that countries like Russia uh, do not create opportunities for themselves to abuse their monopoly power. Um, so I think that's what we are looking to. And we need to resolve the sec food security issues, so maybe using modern technology, uh, new innovation in, uh, in agriculture to make countries more self-reliant eventually yeah thank you timothy those are great points and and really added value to what natalia also said earlier um i have a ton more a ton of more questions for both of you but um before i ask some of those questions if time allows um, i'm first going to turn to two of my colleagues professor merrick caldor and dr luke cooper uh, to make a brief comment to make some brief comments and ask uh, a few questions to our panelists Mary, um, I will start with you, so please unmute for us. Thank you. Uh, you're still, oh, there yeah, you go. Yeah, I've, I've unmuted myself. Great to see you, Natalia and Timothy, and fantastic points. I suppose I've got a big question about the direction of the economy. You know, I know recently Labour was deregulated uh, in the Parliament. And I'm thinking, isn't it time to go to move on a major basis towards a war economy? There shouldn't be uh, in a war, at least in a classic war between states, there shouldn't be unemployment when there are desperate needs of both armaments and food and energy and all of the other things you've been talking about. So, doesn't it require? all sorts of things which up to which in recent years have been anathema to economists doesn't it require planning maybe nationalization of some sectors uh taxation of oligarchs increased taxation all the things that go with a classic war economy a real shift in how the economy is organized and maybe I could just add to that as I will just uh, to before you so you can think about it a bit further and just to echo Mary's um, remarks about how interesting this has been. I've been making lots and lots of notes. 
I agreed really strongly with how you were framing the, the role of international support. And I think the idea, the very innovative idea of setting up um, international agency, perhaps led by the EU in tandem with the Ukrainian government, seemed really like an excellent idea that urgently needs to be pursued. And the generally still military aid, my sense is, 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 is getting to Ukraine. Of course, it can get to Ukraine faster, but military aid is coming in. But it seems that the international community, and in this context, of course, we tend to mean the International Monetary Fund, aka the very wealthy nations that have the capacity um, to support Ukraine, the international community is still being slow to get the urgent economic aid to support Ukrainian uh, social infrastructure into the country. And perhaps I think still treating this like a normal um, economic crisis that Ukraine is experiencing when it's clearly not a normal economic crisis. So to echo Mary's comments on the war economy, doesn't more attention need to be given to uh, planning instruments? I think a, a good parallel here is, of course, Britain. I mean, Britain was based during World War II. We, Britain was basically bankrupt. Um, it was bailed out famously by the United States, but no one ever remembers Canada either. I mean, Canada actually, much smaller economy gave in proportional terms vast amounts of money um, to the UK. And we had a very careful social compromise um, that I think should be Ukrainians need to consider. I mean, strikes were banned, so it was quite draconian. But on the other hand, the entire labor movement was basically brought in to the government to agree wage rates, um, to, agree, uh, to, to agree working conditions. And conscription was introduced, not just for the armed forces, but to support um, industries. So famously, people were conscripted to go down um, coal mines. And it seems in this kind of environment, or in this kind of crisis, much greater attention needs to be given to those kinds of coordinated state-led planning instruments in order to ensure that Ukraine's social infrastructure is there in, to prosecute the war. All right. Who should, should go first? Yeah. Yeah. Timothy, go ahead and then I'll tell you. All right. I'll start with the oligarchs. It's not in the news, but the, there are multiple symptoms. There's a front of symptoms suggesting that oligarchs are losing power. In the beginning, my impression was it's temporary. During the war, they sort of uh, stepped back. They're supporting the state. And then the usual social contract we have seen with the elites over so many centuries in different countries, you know, during the time of crisis or war, the political elites or business elites support the government, support the royal, for example, the king, the crown, to finance the war and win it. And in case the war is, is won, they expect some spoils. And so I was thinking that's what the oligarchs are doing, because suddenly they became good oligarchs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and everyone was great, you know, finally we're seeing the right attitude from the oligarchs. And, and I was, you know, very privately by telling to people, wait a second, isn't it that they always do look at the last 500 years, you know, of uh, recorded history. That's the social contract between the oligarchs and the, the political elites during the war. That's exactly why they will come back right after the war and will say, now we want to privatize something, now we want to have appointments, now we want to have rents, and so on and so forth. However, what we have been seeing lately is that they started giving up or being squeezed out of serious assets. Uh, assets which ensured their standing, their political standing. For example, Renat Akhmetov recently just abandoned all of his uh, communication company and said, well, we're just shutting it down. We see that they are planning uh, to build a new plant, a uh, metallurgical plant outside of Ukraine. A lot of people consider that to be a bad thing, but upon reflection, a careful reflection, means we will have multiple metallurgical plants in Ukraine. We'll have, we will not have a single dominant player. And that might have more benefits even though we, you, we lose a plant. 
And in the EU, if they bring their business to the EU, they will be subject to the EU regulation. So they will have to be cleaned up. You know, they won't be able to play two games within the, within the same holdings. Kalamoisky was just, uh, well, it's not publicly known that there are a lot of rumors that Kolomoisky was taking away the Ukrainian passport. Now he is subject to extradition to the United States the moment the United States would like to extradite him on the criminal offenses opened against them for money laundering in the United States. And uh, these are two most powerful oligarchs in Ukraine. And there are other symptoms. They start losing power. And when I talk privately to the politicians, they say, yes, the president and the administration and the prime minister are squeezing them gradually. Not a black to, you know, zero to one policy, but more of a continuous, you know, one step at a time every day. So I think that's interesting. Similarly, Firtash, you know, recently his, uh, Firtash is the Ukrainian oligarch who is in Austria fighting extradition charges from the United uh, States for several years now. Uh, he owns a lot of gas distribution companies. These companies have been nationalized. That's again, not in the news, not publicly known, but a lot of these assets have been confiscated on the grounds that these assets either have been leased or privatized illegally, or they have partners from Russia. So therefore we are actually seeing these forces that the government is stepping in, nationalizing businesses, ensuring uh, jobs, and kicking uh, oligarchs away. This is everything, Mary, you have said. It's just not being announced as a policy, but it is happening. And it's not happening, you know, tomorrow we announce a new government policy. It's more every day a little bit. So there's a power struggle inside Ukraine, I think, about these new policies, but they are happening. Now, the concern, of course, many people are raising is uh, will not we lose a lot of private sector during this process? But since this appears to be hitting really oligarchs, I think those fears are not justified. Now, on the coordination uh, of the international aid and on the speed of arrival, yes, it is slow. And it's a bit of a scandal. Even the IMF, you know, it's a... Uh, it's just not a normal time. It's already, even in the peace time, we would be considered right now facing a macroeconomic crisis because we just devalued our currency by 25%. We have more than 20% inflation and we have a running uh, budget deficit of maybe maybe five or maybe very, uh, could very well be 15, 20% by the end of the year. You know, it depends. And one third of our budget deficit we are financing through printing money. So this is, qualifies as macroeconomic crisis and the IMF should be here already with the program. And they're not even thinking about the program. They're not even starting to write it up. And that's not a peacetime situation, it's a military, it's a war situation. So the, the macroeconomic crisis is much more serious potentially. So they just don't want to deal with that. They don't know how to deal with it or they don't, you know, don't want to deal with it. But that's a problem. And I think everyone should be screaming at every corner about this. Because we will end up with a macroeconomic crisis in Ukraine. And it's going to make things so much more difficult for everyone. It's going to hit morale. It's going to increase the cost of finance and, you know, how much we have to support. It might uh, increase the length of the war and so on and so forth. So we have to prevent that. So these are my comments. Thank you, Timothy. Um, let's go to Natalia, and I'd be very interested what you have to say about Mary's uh, comment about perhaps nationalizing certain sectors and, and uh, some of the other ideas. Timothy left uh, in a difficult one. Uh, so uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, when the war started, we really we're thinking a lot how to do exactly what Marie said, how to shift the economy to this war uh, mode. Um, what I think now, I think uh, as of now, most of the economy that could be could have been restructured or used for military purposes, mostly, maybe not everything, but is already there. For example, um, military forces nation, like nation ceased, nationalized, I don't know what the legal mechanism is there, but they took, for example, uh, storage, refrigerating capacities, 
some production capacities uh, of uh, the businesses uh, to use them for military purposes. And uh, that's already uh, going. Then there were other types of like interventions like price regulations uh, or agreements with the uh, market participants that something gonna happen certain way. For example, when the war uh, started, there was a lot of coordination between the government and uh, uh, food producers, food uh, distributors, and with uh, uh, gasoline uh, produ producers and uh, distributors, uh, with retailers. Uh, so something of that became like formal regulation of prices, but, but something was really some kind of <laughs> other kind of intervention. Right now, uh, what we observe is that uh, there doesn't seem to be deficit of supply of something. So maybe for military purposes, there is deficit. We want to produce HIMARS, but we can't. And it's uh, no matter how our government tries to make someone do it, it will not succeed. So that's kind of another kind of question where current economy, like nationalizing, doing something would not help. But in all other sectors, we don't have like uh, major supply issues uh, for internal economy. Uh, what we do have, we have problems on the uh, like side of demand because some people are not able to pay for the goods, for rent, uh they 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 lost incomes they lost uh, uh some became disabled so that's uh, kind of an actual question of the economy which requires probably other kind of solutions so as of now I, while i was uh, uh like advocating for this idea from the very beginning uh, i don't uh, even see potential where government can do something else and not to make more damage than get benefit. In principle, yeah, they can, you know, create workplaces and put people who are unemployed to work there. And in principle, this is good idea. This is very specific intervention. But then why it's not happening is because it's it takes a normal capability to do something like that, right? You, you should be as smart, but uh, 1,000 times smarter as businessmen to create something like that. So uh, I, still, I, I still think there is potential for this active labor market policies and some like job creation, whatever it means, or some policies, you know, building something for internally displaced or people who lost uh, uh, houses. Uh, but these are specific interventions rather than you know whole scale going to the uh, military economy so that that's how i would answer but that's a very you, very good question um thank you natalia um i before i turn back to mary and luke i'm um, to ask if they have another uh, question perhaps for you i just wanted to uh, remind both natalia and timothy i send you a direct message so please look uh it, at your um, zoom messages uh, Mary, would you like to ask another question? Well, I'm very aware that we only have five minutes left. Yeah, okay. And I okay. think there was a question from the audience about higher education. They are, they are and some since great questions. We're working together with Natalia and Timothy to try to help sustain higher education. Seems like a really good question that we should end on. I uh, thank you so much. Timothy and Natalia for your answers to my question, because I think there's really fast, it's really fascinating. And I would love that we have another session where we think through the agency or the platform mm -hmm. and also these questions linked to these questions about the war economy, but we could talk about that later. But in the meantime, maybe we should end with higher education. Yeah, let, uh, um, let me ask one or two follow up questions to both panelists if they have another minute, uh, uh, you know, related to these questions from our audience, because we do have a lot of great questions. One is from John uh, Vandervet, a uh, postgrad student at Bristol University. He said, uh, You mentioned the war's impact on Ukraine's education sector, but I'm curious to know 
your projections of how domestic higher education infrastructure will cover. Will international youth and domestic for, for uh, that matter return to study in Ukraine or go elsewhere? Nat Natalia, I think I'll ask that question to you. Thank you. Um, I will start and uh, I will actually ask for help from Timothy uh, because I work with policy and they work with university staff. Uh, the estimate of damages is uh, uh, around uh, 3.6 billion in education and uh, it is uh, almost 2,000 different kirden gardens and other types of educational institutions of higher level. So that's huge and it means that Physically, some uh, kids and some people cannot go to school. And then, uh, like, not from this number, but right now, no one can go anywhere if there is no quality bombshell, which also restricts the supply of uh, these educational institutions. Uh, more strategically, um, yeah, Timothy, can you help me with, like, what's this? Yeah, I think the Ukrainian education industries in deep crisis which will force it revival it's in deep crisis because uh, students and high school students and university students they've just uh, gone to let's say poland and have experienced better education it's in a safer environment more international and so they can compare at the same time during the war unfortunately the education is not the highest priority for spending and so, you know, all the support which was going to the education uh, is going to be taking a back seat. You know, we basically will not have funding and the universities will be suffering and the schools will be suffering and maybe many will bankrupt. They will lose faculty and so on. At the same time, institutions like ours, the Kiev School of Economics, are thriving financially. We, this week, we're closing a deal on buying out our building because we have so many donations, well, not too many, but enough to buy out. And also we're thinking about buying a private school, which is a great school, but they're struggling. So we're expanding. And the reason is that now when the state cannot financially support outdated, corrupt, Soviet-style education, they don't have a subsidy. We're in equal conditions. And suddenly the market mechanisms are at work. Then people are saying, you know, if I cannot study for free in a university, in a state-owned university, then I can as well look at the quality. And so the top universities, the top quality universities become, you know, become successful. And I think after the war, that process will continue even more because this uni the country will be transforming, the economy will be transforming. They, they, these universities and the schools will provide proper skills. For the international students, I think it will be a fun country to visit and study if the war is over, because it will be an amazing experience to be here among the people who have, you know, who have just fought their independence war. That doesn't happen in a lifetime. So exchange programs will be booming. I'm pretty sure exchange students will be coming and some will be doing professional degrees and so on and so forth. So I'm very optimistic, but we need to get the war stopped and we have to save Ukraine and we have to be done with Russia so we can move on with education. Thank you, Timothy. I'm going to ask you two questions also from our um, audience members directed at you. Uh, one from Ivan Krompis is asking, what strategies would be best to rebuild Ukraine, and how will accountability in rebuilding Ukraine be ensured? And it kind of relates to some of the, one of the issues that you touched on earlier. There's also a related question from Juan Grant, who's asking, who's listening to you in the West about uh, building a, a more resilient uh, or uh, 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 economy in Ukraine? Thank you, Timothy. Yeah, so, um... I think the accountability issue is addressed by splitting the projects into something very specific. You know, it's, it's very difficult to talk about the accountability and transparency of spending $40 billion that have been appropriated by the United States, but it's much easier to talk about that, you know, $6 billion went into uh, rebuilding 100 schools. Each school is this much, and here's the school which has been rebuilt, and here's the school which has not been, but the money has been spent. 
the major risks are coming at the procurement stage. Therefore, I think we just, if we understand that, we focus on the procurement and focus on the priorities and on benchmarking that can be done. What is the most resilient model? You know, I think we have to decentralize. We have to give some freedom because people on the ground know better what they need. But at the same time, we have to provide them with technology so they can leapfrog. So that would be my approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Natalia, one final question for you. Um, this is from Sanika Ranadive. She's asking, what could be some of the economic spillovers of this war in terms of energy transition in non-European countries, especially in countries such as China, um, that has Russia as an important energy trading partner? I think just before you answer that question, I'd like to ask you a second question also, and you can be very brief in answering this, but how much is, is Ukraine truly doing in also public, publicizing what this food crisis would mean for uh, uh, other countries outside the traditional kind of uh, countries that have been supporting Ukraine. You know, uh, in, in Africa, for example, you know, we, there have been quite a number of countries that have been reluctant to kind of take sides in, in this conflict. But I think with a food crisis looming, uh, they would have to inevitably uh, take a stance also. Um, you know, so if you look at it from that perspective, you know, what is what is Kiev doing in terms of publicizing this looming food crisis? Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you. So the first question was about um, spillovers. Um, so for countries like uh, China and uh, uh, India, um, they, they, India, for example, they might consider that they are gaining from the war. For example, they can buy Russian oil with 30% discount from the market, right? And then they can use uh, this oil in uh, uh, chemical industry and try to outperform Germany in their chemical industry. Um, however, um, I don't believe that um, European uh, markets would allow this uh, spillover at the end of the day. So that's uh, first argument. And uh, second, uh, I think it will end up with just China and India having more, and Turkey actually also in this uh, part, they also buying more from Russia now. They will end up with uh, sunk costs uh, because of this, you know, so they're trying, basically their strategy right now is to buy out from Russia what others are not buying at lower prices. But I think it will, it will be a sunk cost specifically because they will not be able to monetize uh, higher on the value chain, uh, these uh, gains, and they will just leave us, you know, uh, lost money for these uh, purchases. With China, of course, this is totally marginal expenditures and uh, they have bigger agenda. I think uh, all this uh, is, uh, creates a little bit more headache for them because they need to, for this uh, nice, you know, uh, restructuring of supplies from Russia to China, they need to change infrastructure. So it's a rather headache, but I, I think for, for uh, Ch Chinese economy, it's very marginal and doesn't mean uh, really a lot. Um, so uh, the second question was about uh, food uh, security. Um, so I, I think uh, I think the government of Ukraine is really promoting a lot this problem, and uh, uh, they could have been alternative, right? So they could have not even using this wording about food security in other countries, but they uh, do so. So they start from others outside of Ukraine suffering, so let's help them. And I think it's a big deal and they're really uh, doing their best to get um, uh, supplies to these uh, countries. And uh, I know that at all, at least diplomatic levels, this is raised everywhere. Uh, to influence like in UN and in, in all countries, it's always raised and uh, Ukraine is trying to find, you know, some ways how to uh, help out. Um, but 
yeah, Russia doing the same too. So of course, Russia has a lot of presence in this uh, region, uh, in Africa in the, and uh, in the Middle East. And uh, this uh, country surprisingly influenced the situation a lot. Uh, and I think it's still open question how uh, the history will turn uh, for uh, Middle East and for Africa. So where they where where they gonna be? What decision they still to make? Because they are, you know a little bit with Russia, a little bit not with Russia. Uh, I think it's a lot of uncertainties about that. Yeah, important point, of course. Uh, while Lavrov is visiting uh, a number of African countries at, at present, so it's a diplomacy versus diplomacy issue here. Um, exactly, exactly. Because in UN, one country, one vote. You know. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately, yes. Um, I know we've run out of time. I know there are lots of further burning questions also from our audience members, but I do have to let all of you go. Uh, Timothy and, and Natalia, um, I, I really enjoyed the synergy between the two as uh, two of you as panelists. You've really complemented each other um, extremely well. Um, I think the timing of this discussion is also important as we're asking more questions what can what else can we do to support Ukraine uh, and 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 uh, you know starting to think more and more about uh, some of the long term implications of uh, this conflict on Ukraine's uh, development? It's it's inevitably going to affect all uh, of of your uh, strategic development goals uh, going forward for for the medium to long term. So. Um, uh, thank you so much for contributing to this debate, and I hope to have both of you back on, on the uh, Russia-Ukraine dialogues at some point again in the future. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in, and, and Mary and Luke, thank you for your contributions as well. Um, see you all soon for another Russia-Ukraine dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>